Hey, good evening. I'm really happy that you were able to join us tonight in our Bible study. This is a pre-recorded video. I said last week I wasn't going to be here, but I thought since we have all this technology and we can do it, I'd go ahead and bring this next video so that we could still enjoy it. So if this is the first time that you've come to our YouTube channel, I hope that you would subscribe. And if you've been here multiple times and you've been watching, don't forget to click like. It helps us to get these videos out to other people. So tonight's video is going to be the golden age of David Rain, and we're going to look at the transition moving over to Solomon. So I hope that you'll enjoy the video, and next week when I get back, we'll have the next one. And uh, if you want to, drop some comments down there in the comment box, and I'll read those, and we'll discuss them next week. So without further ado, let's get to the video. Once David and Bathsheba learned that Adonijah was trying to anoint himself king down in, in Rogel, they put Solomon on the king's donkey and brought him down to the Gihon Spring. And what you're looking at below us is the Canaanite pool dates back 3,800 years, 800 years prior to King David. And many archeologists believe that this is where the water pooled up from the Gihon Spring and this is where Solomon was anointed king. If you listen, you can kind of hear the water still coming out of the Gihon Spring as it travels down the tunnel. They believe that this pool was in use a long time for the Canaanites and the Jebusites before David made Jerusalem his capital. Because this has been in the same spot for 3,800 years, we're highly confident that this is the location of where King Solomon was anointed third king of Israel. David was getting old and he had not formally named his successor. And one of his sons, Adonijah, decided to take that job on for himself. Over in 1 Kings 1, Adonijah is trying to stage a coup and he and his friends have gone down to a place called Enrogel. Where is that in this landscape? It's located right at the bottom of the hill right down there. And that's where Adonijah had his feast. He had priests down there and either generals for his army. And he was trying to proclaim himself as king. Nathan and Bathsheba come to David and let him know what's going on. His health has been failing. He's not as aware of what's going on. And when he hears about it, he sends Zadok the priest and Nathan and his son Solomon on his donkey down to the Gihon Spring where he would be anointed as the next king. That's correct. Now what's interesting about that, here are all the people yeah. that are around here. Yeah. This is a very public place and the sound just kind of reverberates through this valley. Well, the Bible tells us that when that occurred, they heard the trumpets and the people were cheering and that sound reverberated down the valley and the party that was going on with Adonijah, they heard that. And a messenger came from this area down to Enrogel and said, Solomon has now been appointed the king. Imagine how Adonijah felt when he heard that in the middle of what he was trying to attempt. And when he gets that message, he rushes back up the hill to where they worshiped and grab the horns of the altar, trying to keep Solomon from killing him for trying to take his place. Saul was the first anointed king. And when it was finally time to anoint him publicly, he was found hiding in the luggage. He wasn't really fit and ready to do what God needed him to do. When David's anointed, that's done pretty privately, just with his family. And then he has to wait more than a decade before he's publicly anointed. And this is the first time in the monarchy where the kingship is being passed from father to son. Adonijah is trying to supplant that. Uh, you've got this attempted coup and Solomon is anointed in a rush, but still it's public enough that everyone hears and knows that it's happened. And so even in the process of their anointings, it changes. Even though you go from Saul to David and David to Solomon and, and you seem to increase, the nation grows, it expands, it's still not the king that they're looking for. They're imperfect men and they make mistakes. And even though there's been a prophesied king that's going to come, they're still waiting to see that in the historical record. Once Solomon became king, he pushed the city up the hill so that he built the temple on the very top. 
So with these layers of history, you've got the original Jebusite city that David captured. He expands that city to the point where it becomes Mount Zion, the city of David. But then Solomon takes it to a whole new level and the city grows to the point where he has to continue moving up toward Mount Moriah. That's right. He wanted to put the temple as high as he could in the city to give proper reverence to God. The splendor of Solomon's temple was world renowned from biblical accounts. We don't have that temple remaining. That was destroyed millennia ago. King Herod built the second temple. That's not even standing anymore. So when people talk about how do we know there was a Solomon? How do we know that he actually built anything? What's left? I think we need to talk to people who are authorities on the matter. There have been some things found and I think what's really interesting is how those things were found. Within recent years, there's a project that's been going on in Jerusalem in which they've been able to go through a lot of rubble that's been found underneath the Temple Mount. The lead archaeologist, Dr. Barkai, lives here in Jerusalem, and I think it'd be beneficial if we went and talked to him and see what we can learn from him. In 1999, as a result of certain political developments, uh, there was a criminal act taking place. I would call it a, uh, an archaeological crime. A gigantic pit was dug without any scholarly supervision in the southeastern part of Temple Mount under the excuse of an emergency exit. They removed approximately 400 truckloads of earth. That earth was dumped in the Kidron Valley. From there, we moved the soil here. This is the place where the first stage of sifting took place. How did you know that the earth had been moved from the Temple Mount? We have eyewitnesses that followed the trucks and came there. The second way of proving it is via the internal contents of the soil. For example, we have several thousands of gilded wall mosaic tesserae, which once decorated the Dome of the Rock. They could come only from the Temple Mount. We have even a seal of the Islamic trust of the Temple Mount. Dr. Barkai is able to take us down and explain that they currently process not only the fill that was brought over from the Temple Mount, but they also process and sift material from all sorts of archaeological sites around Israel. This is the place where the larger stones are removed from the contents of the soil. This is done like this. I see. Every one bucket goes in here yes. and it is subdivided into three-thirds. The rest of the space in the bucket is taken by the water. Okay. One-third soil, two-thirds water. Mm -hmm. How long does it soak? Several hours. Several hours. As you know, there are people that question whether the first kings of Israel were historical figures or legendary, and whether there's anything that we can tie to that period of time and it sounds like that you have found some incredible things. Listen, I'm a Jerusalemite for the last uh, 68 years. I was not around some 3,000 years ago, so right. I cannot testify for David living here or being here. On the other hand, if I read the scriptures well, there are so many things there which seem to be a reality. I'm dealing with archaeology, I'm dealing with material culture. Solomon built an official compound made up of the king's palace, the construction of which took 13 years. There was the house of the forest of Lebanon, the house of Pharaoh's daughters, there was the great court, there was the other court, there was the house of the Lord. All that becomes alive when we sift through the material originating in the Temple Mount. We have abundance of pottery, 
We have a plethora of other finds from First Temple period. The period cannot be denied. Yeah. Again, I was not an eyewitness. Right. I didn't meet them personally, but right. meeting the material culture of their time and meeting the texts, I have the feeling as if I shook their hands. Temple Mount is the soul, heart, and spirit of the Jewish people. That is the place of traditionally the binding of Isaac by Abraham. That is the place purchased by David from the last Jebusite ruler of Jerusalem, Aravna. That is the place where David's son Solomon built the house of the Lord. And until this very day, all synagogues all around the world, they are directed towards the Temple Mount of Jerusalem. It is also the number one archaeological site in this country and maybe in the world. Nevertheless, it was not exposed to the spade of an archaeologist ever. Mm -hmm. So Jerusalem, which is one of the most excavated places upon earth, mm -hmm. has a black hole. Altogether, in these 14 years of sifting, we have had over half a million finds. The vast majority of it is, of course, pottery, but pottery is dateable. We have only, again, small finds. Those include jewelry, they include artifacts of ancient warfare, they include dice and playing pieces, they include coins in abundance. About 9% of the dated finds that we have are from First Temple period. Amazing. Our general work does not try to prove anything or to disprove anything. We are interested in whatever is found. We are interested in the facts and the conclusions that we can draw from the facts. The difference in this project is nothing is C2. It's all been tumbled together. That is correct and that is a challenge. Yeah. The sifting project is the closest that we can get to a controlled archaeological excavation in the Temple Mount. What's the most unique thing that stands out to you that you've found so far there? The people. Hmm. It is amazing. Children, elderly, students, religious, non-religious, ultra-religious, all kinds of types of people. And we have had people from all four corners of the world. We have had an incredible number of volunteers. They were about a quarter of a million people, which makes this project into the most exposed archaeological project in the world. To look into the eyes of a child who finds a coin which was not touched by somebody for 2,000 years, or to look into the eyes of an elderly person who realizes that he touches the sacred soil of the Temple Mount and the excitement of these people, that is unparalleled. So the greatest discovery of mine was the people. We're not able to go back and uncover Solomon's Temple, and who knows if or when we'll be able to actually do any official archeological work on the Temple Mount. But from that discarded dirt, the Temple Mount Sifting Project has been able to produce and discover some pretty impressive things. He was able to show us several pieces that dated back to David's time in, in a United Kingdom. No one would have wanted what happened in 1999 to have happened. No one would have wanted that to have been disturbed. But it provided you an opportunity to find things like this. And after doing that for 14 years, what conclusions have you reached about what you have found and how it connects to the Davidic united monarchy. Listen, I cannot prove through the finds anything. I cannot prove that there was a David, but we have uh, indirect circumstantial evidence that there was much activity at that time. I'll tell you more than that. Five years after the death of Solomon, in the days of Rehoboam, the country was attacked by Shishak, king of Egypt. Now, why would Shishak attack uh, that place if it was a small village. That attack is documented in Egyptian sources. It would be impossible to assume that five years after Solomon, 
the Bible is historically correct. And five years earlier, all of it is fantasy and all of that is fiction. That is beyond my logic. There's another quote from an archaeologist and I thought it was interesting, that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. I never ever draw any conclusion from absence of material. If you draw conclusions from the absence of material, you can come to the conclusion that the ancient caveman uh, spoke on radio telephone because we didn't find the wires. That's anti-logical. Dr. Barkai, it has been an honor to be with you. Thank you for sharing your office and your knowledge with us today. The privilege is mine. Dr. Barkai is just a wealth of knowledge. I mean, we could have spent days with him and still not exhausted his knowledge on the topics of archaeology in Israel. Having him explain the significance of what they've found and what it attests to was especially moving. I wish everybody who's trying to answer the question, was there really a Saul, David, and Solomon? I wish all of them could be in those labs. I wish all of them could see those artifacts be brought out. I wish all of them could meet the archaeologists that pulled them out of the ground. They're there and they're real. I think to ignore them is going to hinder anybody's honest search about the reality of the United Kingdom. One of the things that came out of that period of time was literature and songs, music. Well, that brings us here to Qumran. Qumran sits on the northwest corner of the Dead Sea. You can see the Dead Sea spread out here before us. But behind us is the caves of Qumran. You can see a couple of the caves here, and there are more caves around the corner and throughout these hills. In 1946, a Bedouin shepherd stumbled into one of these caves and found a number of scrolls. And they began to inspect them and they realized that there were scriptures written on them. They found portions of copies of every single book except for Esther. The scrolls actually went through a number of different hands, but today, if you want to, you can actually go and see them at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. They have dated a number of these scrolls to the first, second, and third century BC. And so in particular, if you think about the time of the United Kingdom, these are copies of the originals that were only placed seven or 800 years after their originals were written. How many Old Testament manuscripts do we have? We don't know the exact number, but they are in the thousands. Some of them are very small, but they can use those to piece together a much larger document. There are some books though, for instance, the Isaiah scroll, in which we have an entire copy of that book available to us. For a number of authors that we appreciate, like Plato and Aristotle, we have less than a dozen copies. However, when it comes to the Hebrew Bible, we have thousands of copies of manuscripts. And because of that, we can have an even greater confidence that what we read today when we open up our Bible is accurate to the original writings. And you think about what that should do for people. I mean, most historians don't question the authenticity of these other ancient works when they have less than a dozen copies, but it comes down to the Bible or the ancient Hebrew or even the ancient Greek text. And we have thousands, if not tens of thousands of copies. That should reinforce or bolster anybody's faith when they come to realize that. Qumran isn't a place that you would automatically think about David or Solomon or the United Monarchy, but we're told in the Bible, Solomon wrote 3,000 Proverbs, 1,001 songs. To go back to what does the text say, you need to have a reliable text. It's like building a house. You need to have an accurate blueprint. We can trust what we have. It's accurate, and it's accurate so many times over. And I think that's huge, especially for those of us in the West, especially for young people, college students, high school students, who in the West are being told, no, that's not a historical document, that's just a legendary document, or that's just a cultural document. The details are too specific just to be a cultural document. We find evidence in the archeological record that fit what's in that document. We have so many copies from independent places around the globe that match if you came to that question, can we trust the accuracy of the Bible with an open mind, without bias, and just looked at it fairly, that you'd walk away with the conclusion 
I can trust what that says. These texts were written by the Essenes. Essenes were a Jewish sect, and they lived here at Qumran. And they had particular rooms in which they wrote a number of these documents that were later stored here in the caves. You can see the different rooms. So this was someone's house. Yeah. It'd be such a stark contrast from one side to the other to be able to see the Judean hills over here, but then the Dead Sea over here. Water is vital for their survival down here. As they collected the rainwater, it would come down this little trough and it would fall into this little bitty pool. Once the pool filled up, it would spill over into this larger cistern. In doing so, it leaves the sediment that was in the water in this smaller pool so the water in the cistern was perfectly clean. So it was an ancient filtration system. Exactly. I think it would surprise people to see how many ritual baths and all of the water that that would have required. And they would go through a ritual cleansing multiple times per day. And so the need for good, clean water was important to them. And this could be used as a community room. You can see the seating all the way around here. What this is explaining over here is this would have been for studying and that they found a lot of oil lamps for light in this room. The oil lamps could be easily set up here on these rocks to light the entire room here. Why did the Essenes find such value in preserving these texts? Well, I think they found value for the same reasons that we find value. You look at the Song of Solomon, it's a song about the love that he has for a woman. You look at the Proverbs. How often do I open up the Proverbs if I'm having some problem in life? I can find something there that I can use today. Even Ecclesiastes Kohelet, the preacher, where he's answering this question of, is life meaningless or not? And he's answering, with God in view, it's not. Without God in the picture, it really feels like it's meaningless. And of course, then we can look at the Psalms, and we use those same songs today in our praise to God. A lot of people have the misconception that the Bible is very flat. But with this poetic literature, God is trying to evoke emotions. He's trying to get an emotional response to truth. The books that we're talking about that David and Solomon contributed to are rich. And God included that kind of text, and it was preserved. And those types of writings accomplished that. The people who lived during the reign of Saul, David, and Solomon, they were looking for a ruler. They knew that even from back in the days of Joseph from Genesis. God had promised a ruler that was going to come from the tribe of Judah. All of these centuries, they've been looking for the Lord's anointed. And that's one of the reasons they got so excited when Saul was finally anointed, why they celebrated David, this man after God's own heart, who was by far an improvement over Saul and the continuation of his kingship through Solomon and hopefully down through the line. To be on this side of history, we recognize that all of those prophecies were pointing to the true king, God's son, from the tribe of Judah, this man who took on flesh. That was part of what the people thought they saw in Jesus. They had a misconception about his kingdom. They didn't understand that it was a spiritual kingdom, but they recognized there's a king here. That's what they celebrated during the triumphal entry. It's what Pilate asked him about. Are you really the king of the Jews? It's the accusation that went above his cross. And so we recognize that Jesus is the prophesied king. We've been looking for evidences of the United Kingdom, but all of the men from that United Kingdom just foreshadowed the true king, Jesus. Having Barry bring me here has been so helpful to think about what's the most accurate, best way to answer that question. Is the United Monarchy something that has historical roots or is it simply a myth or a legend? And I think coming here and seeing these places and speaking with these experts, hearing their experience, it helps increase my faith and trust in the biblical record. There's a quote from a book that's currently out of print where the author is trying to help his unbelieving friend wrestle with faith. And I think it just sums up this entire trip. What he writes is, Faith is a venture based on evidence. Evidence adequate enough to justify the decision to leap. Evidence adequate enough to create hope in the success of leaping. I would say that my job as an apologist is to encourage responsible leaping. I try to show that the leap is not hopeless, that you can reach the other side, that many have done it before you, that the dangers below aren't as great as you think. Beyond this, however, the apologist can't go. I present the evidence. You must decide to leap. We have all of this evidence, and there's no final proof that is going to convince everybody. At the end of the day, each of us has to make a decision based on the evidence. 
is that adequate enough to justify the decision to place my faith in what the text says? And at the conclusion of all of this, personally, the answer is yes. And I hope that whoever's taken this journey with us would reach the same conclusion. So what'd you think? That was a great video, wasn't it? I hope you really enjoyed it. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and also drop down some comments in the comments on Facebook or YouTube so that next week when I come back, we'll be able to take a look and review those. So I hope you have a fantastic week. Don't forget, uh, not this week for our podcast, but we'll see you in a week after that. And I hope you guys have a blessed week. We'll see you later.